Next speaker is Dr. Pranay Oza. You all know Pranay. He will be talking on <coughs> troubleshooting emergencies and crisis management on ECMO. Thank you Dr. Bala and Dr. Suresh for uh, organizing the conference in the first place and uh, giving me an opportunity to talk. Uh, we'll be, I'll be talking on troubleshooting. Probably it should have even come before winning. <laughs> uh, but I'll be just talking on uh, troubleshooting in ECMO is going to be a huge topic per se. Uh, but I, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take only a few of them because already few of them is already been taken and I think the bleeding and everything is going to come uh, for the next. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to enlarge uh, what are the troubleshooting scenarios that can come up. Uh, and what I'm going to discuss in detail is mechanical issues like uh, pump and oxygen of thrombosis, exit and decandidation, and patient related issues like low flows and low mean arterial pressures in VA. So what are the troubleshoots you see when you put the patient on any, any patient on ECMO? You might get the staff to call you that you are not, you are not getting enough flow. You might see the hypoxia. Uh, patient, the staff says you that the patient is uh, hypoxic now. You have to do something for that. The CO2 might be going up or going down in ABG. Uh, you might see a hypotension. You might see the elevated lactates or low venous saturation, uh, especially in the VA ECMO. You might the patient becomes oliguric. You might see a, uh, something like a cocoa you know, you see a severe hemolysis and the commonest which we usually see is the bleeding. So these are the things which you can see when the, there's a patient on ECMO. Now whenever you are dealing with any troubleshoots, uh, you have to keep in mind that this is a blender of man and machine. So it can be a problem with the patient itself or can be a problem with the machine itself. Uh, the one which is very common and probably easy and probably a dreadful is the technical issues. So technical issues, uh, you have to always think and rule it out at first because they are easy to diagnose, number one. And number two, uh, when you do it, uh, they are usually life-threatening. So you have to always first find out okay, what are the, uh, if there are any technical issues. If they are not, then you can have a time to think and then treat it. So how do we uh, you know, arrange your technical issues? First is we have to see whether it is calibration is proper or no, your SPO2 probe is uh, attached properly or no, your uh, pressures are your, uh, there, so whether it has been calibrated, your pressure length has been calibrated or no. Check for the circuit pressures. Okay. For the circuit pressures, if the pre-pump pressures, if the pre-pump pressures is too negative, it means that okay, the patient is going to be volume depleted or there's a, something wrong with the cannula position, so you have to correct that. Look for the pre and post oxygen pressures that tells you many information like delta pressure, if it's elevated, that tells you about the oxygen failure. So just go for a pre and post oxygen pressures. Uh, see the flow rate, whether it is set, what are the set, it is going properly. See the flow rate, blood and sweep gas rate. Check for the RPM and flow rate, that's a very important thing. You have to see the RPM and the blood flow rate rate. As it is a centrifugal pump, your blood flow rate may not be the same as what you set with the RPM. The same, uh, with the same RPM, the blood flow rate keeps on going up and down. And that depends basically on preload and afterloads. So if there are any change in the preload or afterload, with the same blood flow rate, you might have a change in the, uh, with the same RPM, you might have a change in the blood flow rate. So you have to just keep that in mind. Okay, with the same RPM, the blood flow is going down. It means there's something wrong with the circuit. And check for all the connectors whether they are loose, there can be air that can go inside or there can be bleeding from there. So what will your approach when you see the patient or when you have a troubleshoot? First is to recognize the troubleshoot. And recognize is more important to recognize before the catastrophic event comes place, takes place. That means what, when I say when there is a decrease in the, uh, uh, when uh, before the oxygen gets completely clogged and you see the, uh, the flow comes down, you should recognize it when the, there is an increase in the delta pressures. So that is what is most important measure, uh, keeping a watch on the circuit pressures. So when the delta pressure is going up, you should recognize the dead stage. If you recognize, because if you recognize the dead stage, you will probably try to, uh, you know, find out an alternative. You might have to change the oxygen to you keep everything ready and do that. If you just come to know suddenly where the oxygen stops, then there will be a catastrophe. Okay. So first, you have to recognize the problem. Second, you have to see whether it requires an immediate attention and whether it requires immediate management. So for example, accidental decanulation will require immediate management. If there is a big clot in the pump and pump stops suddenly, you require, it requires immediate management. So first is recognize, second is immediate management if required. 
Third is you diagnose the cause. What has led to all this? Why this event has occurred? And fourth is you manage that particular event so that the next thing it, it does not repeat again. So this is the way you should approach to it. Now I'll go to the specific uh, the pump failure. Pump failure causes it can be because of there can be a clot in the pump head, or there can be a because most of the pumps are like a bearing, so there's a break in the one of the bearing that can be lead, or there's an excessive heat generated within the pump head. Now usually this is more seen uh, about heat generation is more seen in metronic uh, pump as compared to other pumps. So uh, other pumps you don't see much of the heat generation, but in metronic pump you see, and even after seven eight days you might need to change the metronic pumps. So how do you diagnose it? There will be hematuria or there will be coca cola colored urine that suggests you have hemolysis. On auscultation, regular auscultation of pump, you might start, start getting some crackling sounds. There can be a sudden increase in the noise from the pump head that suggests that their bearing is broken and but that will lead to hemolysis. What is important is when there is a pump failure, there is no change in the circuit pressure and most important is there is a decrease in the flow with the same RPM. Okay. So there is no change in the uh, circuit pressures, your pre-pump, post-pump and pre-oxygenator, post-oxygenator pressures remains more or less same and sudden decrease in the flow with the same RPM, you should always think that there can be a clot in the uh, pump and that can be a catastrophe. So there you have to be mindful about that and that should make you alert and uh, you should be ready with the another pump to change. So what you have to do for that, the treatment is going to change the pump either change the pump or you change the entire circuit, uh, uh, both has got its plus point and negative point. If you just change the pump, the cost will definitely come down. At the same time, you are not keeping the uh, uh, patient uh, open to a new circuit entirely, then there will be a, again an, another surge reaction, uh, additional bulk transfusion, uh, your uh, drug levels will again, because of new circuit, the drug levels will fluctuate. So all that is the problem will come when there is a change in the circuit you required. Uh, because of that, uh, patient has developed hemolysis, so you have to manage the hemolysis part, so you have to use some fluids, yeah, let the patient to diurize, if required, alkaline diuresis. And why it has occurred at the first place? Why the clot has come on the oxygen? You have to find out that, and you probably you need to go up on the anticoagulation and uh, thereby to prevent the second episode like this. Similarly, what are the causes for oxygenator failure? Oxygenator failure can be simple as pulmonary edema. That is what usually is your membrane, what we see is a membrane edema and that you get a water droplets and the, uh, uh, that is in the gas phase of the oxygenator and what you require to do is you have to just increase the sweep gas to set uh, 10 to 15 liters and for a few seconds, 15 seconds or 20 seconds and all the water molecule will come down and that will improve the membrane functions. Usually when there is a membrane edema you get the CO2 going up. So if the CO2 is going up on your uh, ABG then you should always think that it can be because of the uh, membrane edema. You, as a routine, we do it every four hourly. We ask our professionals to do every four hourly so that this should not occur. Okay. There can be a plasma leak, but again, that is not seen with the PMP oxygenator. If it is there, uh, polypropylene oxygenator, you might be able to see the plasma leak. You can be a victim mismatch, embolism, or atelitis. Again, that depends upon the small minor clots in the ECMO, uh, in the oxygenator, ECMO oxygenator that can lead to either of these three. Now, how will you diagnose? On ABG, uh, you see hypoxia or hypercapnia that is coming up. There is an increase in the delta pressure. The, the first, which is most important which thing which happen is increase in the delta pressure and increase in the CO2. That are the things which come. You do a clot uh, torch test. You see the clots or fibrin deposits in the either the venous side or the arterial side of the oxygenator. So you might be able to see that. And if you see a post oxygen blood gas, your PO2 is low and PCO2 is going up. So that are the things which you see, and that means that there is an oxygenator failure. Again, <coughs> management is going to remain the same. You have to either change the oxygenator or you have to change the entire circuit. As I told you, the advantage and disadvantage of changing the components and the changing the circuit is going to remain the same. Again, here again they have uh, some kind of uh, hemolysis will occur because of this. So you have to give fluid, uh, the urine output is less, might have to give some dose, dose of less X. Do alkaline diuresis so that uh, whatever the breakdown products get cleared up and you can prevent the uh, uh, acute kidney injury because of the hemolysis. Uh, and again, you have to think about increasing the anticoagulation if that is an issue. 
The another scenario which we will discuss is accidental decannulation. Now, how will you feel uh, accidental decannulation? First thing is you might able to see the blood coming out of that. That's the commonest thing. But if there's a dressing, <coughs> if the venous uh, lid comes out, then there is a air in the venous limb of the circuit. And if the air is too much, then probably the pump sends it and the pump stops completely because of that. Okay. Blood loss at the cannulation site and cannula is visible outside uh, the insertion site. So this is the way you diagnose. It is very uncommon complications unless uh, I, I haven't seen, I've just heard in one case that the venous cannula has come out uh, in an adult which is very surprising to me. But I've never seen the extended decannulation otherwise because usually we fix it them well and most of our patients are not very much ambulatory. Now when we are going towards a uh, mobile ECMO, these are the things which you need to take care of that. Okay. Uh, it is usually preventable and it is usually devastating uh, because you, are, you lose the ECMO support completely for some time. Till the time you arrange for another person to come and cannulate this uh, patient, you lose the ECMO support. And if the patient is ECMO dependent, then you have a difficult time. So that is going to be a problem. Bleeding is going to be an issue <coughs> and air embolism again, if it isn't, uh, going, uh, air has gone to the artery line, it's going to be a very uh, difficult issue to be faced. So what you do is usually you take the patient off the pipe, uh, off the pump to come immediately. Uh, you increase the ventilator settings and you go up on the inotropic support. You have to manage as if the patient is not on ECMO, so you have to manage that. Call for the help, that is what is most important. Keep the direct pressures on the decannulation site. Arrange for another cannulation. Give fluids if required blood loss, so give blood. And the one cannula which is still inside, you keep that flushing that cannula if you require an ECMO support. If you feel that a person was on the winning side and that time this has occurred, you can still uh, accept a higher support and come off ECMO. But if you feel that you know, patient still depend on ECMO, you have to uh, put another cannula. By the time you put another cannula, keep this cannula flushing every <coughs> 10 to 15 minutes with the hyperionized solution so that there is no clot formed in this cannula. The one which is you usually see commonly is the poor flow. You don't get the enough flow uh, in your circuit, and that is what usually been deflected like this. Okay. So you can see the suction effect on the catheter. Uh, you can see high negative pressures uh, or the pre pump pressures go, goes up more than minus 40, more than minus 70, and there is a decrease in the pump flow with the same RPM. So when you see a chattering like this, what we are supposed to do is, this occurs because the vessel wall gets collapsed or gets sucked on the, uh, the cannula. And so what you require, the first thing which you have to do immediately is decrease the RPM. And keep on decreasing the RPM till the time the chattering stops. So when the chattering stops, it means that the now patient is getting enough flow. Then gradually go up on the RPM and start giving the fluids. That is what the first initial management you have to do when you uh, recognize there is a problem. Now, once the patient is settled down, once you get the flow back, then think about why this has occurred. So first thing is giving your volume and keeping, uh, getting down on the RPM and then gradually increase the RPM till the, uh, to the level where the patient tolerates it. Okay. Then, thing is, you, you need to find out why this has occurred. Now, you, this is common in first 24 to 48 hours uh, because of the surge reaction per se because of echo. <coughs> But if it is occurring after 5 days, after 7 days, after 10 days, then you need to find out what is the cause, why suddenly patient requires start, uh, requirement is increased for the fluid. And we found that okay, commonly it is the early sign of the sepsis where we see patient is going into a sepsis and the fluid requirement suddenly increases. Or there can be a bleeding somewhere in the, uh, from the in, uh, any of the internal cavity, might be a GI bleed or something. Again then, they become hypovolemic and they require fluid requirements. And <coughs> third is your hypoproteinemia and because of that the uh, fluid has been lost in the third space. These are the common reason why you develop a poor management, just 5 minutes extra, if you don't mind. Uh, so another thing is you have to keep in mind is uh, the cannula position, you might have to reposition the cannula if the cannula is uh, not been in proper place. It, usually this occurs when you give a position to the patient, the cannula can migrate somewhere and might have to just pull or push the cannula a bit. And <coughs> if that also does not help in getting a proper fluid, then you might have to think about the dual drainage. You put an additional cannula. Okay. I'll just skip this slide. These are the causes and uh, pathology which I already discussed. Okay. 
Another possibility that you have to keep in mind is some tamponade effect. Patient develop pneumothorax or massive pericardial effusion and that is compressing your venous cannula, you may not get proper drainage. So that is another possibility that you have to keep in mind. Okay. And this is a flow chart. You have to just think about technical issue. If there is yes, then uh, correct the technical issue that is easier. If that is not there, then think about uh, patient related issues. If it is suddenly occurred, most of the time it is either kink in the circuit or can be a cannula malposition. If it is suddenly occurred, the may, your pressures were fine and suddenly it has occurred, it can be either kink in the circuit or cannula malposition. If there is <coughs> not a constant flow, you get a jerking, then you get the shattering, then the tube stabilizes for a minute, then again shattering. Usually this is because the patient is desynchronizing with the ventilation. So what you need to do is you need to sedate the patient properly. If it is gradually, the uh, pre-pump pressures are gradually becoming more and more negative, then it is either a hypovolemia because of sepsis or anything, uh, hypoproteinemia, or can be because of tamponade effect. <coughs> Next important point is hypotension during VA ECMO. First, you have to recognize hypotension. So you have to see about the, whether the uh, oxygen uh, perfusion is proper, the tissue perfusion is proper, so you have to see the lactate levels of mixed venous saturation. Clinically, you will see the patient is cold and clammy, sinus, capillary fill time is increased, oliguric, and with this can be there with, with or without hypotension. So lactate levels is very important, and the lactate level can be increased because of other factors also that you have to always keep in mind. That there can be other reasons for a lactate to go up because of hepatic or renal failure or because of catecholamine infusion if it is already going on. But what is more important is lactate dynamics. And there are studies which say that <coughs> if the lactate level comes down within 72 hours to near normal, then the survival chance is much better as compared to the patient where the lactate level still remains on higher after 72 hours. And there is a direct relation of lactate levels and the predictor of the mortality. If the lactate levels are very high, even after <coughs> say 48 hours of the uh, patient on ECMO, then chances of patient coming out are going to be less. So what is your immediate management? Treat, you, you have to decide first to treat or ignore, you have to increase the flow. So if the pressures are fine, if mean pressure is 60, you may not just uh, treat it, you might just uh, keep it in mind, think for the course. So we have to, whether we need to go do something for that or no. First thing is to increase the blood flow, ECMO flow, because patient is on V ECMO, so increase the ECMO flow, the pressure will go up. In, give some volumes, and if that is not helping, you have to think about using some vasopressors like noradrenaline. What are the causes? Can be inadequate cardiac output. Both your native and ECMO cardiac output may not be sufficient for the patients. In inadequate oxygenation or hypoxia, decrease in hemoglobin either dilutional or blood loss, or it can be increased consumption where a patient is going to sepsis or severe SARS kind of reaction or increased metabolic activity. So, if, if in the inadequate cardiac output, there is a decrease in ECMO flow, that is insufficient ECMO flow, either uh, the preload is less, so you have to give a fluid to the patient because of poor flow or is the increase after load, there can be something wrong in the circuit or there can be some, the SVR is increased or patient is vasoconstricted again the ECMO flow will decrease. So this can be the reason because it can be increased, decrease in the preload or increase in the after load. Okay. Or the patient cardiac condition is deteriorating. So patient is going into cardiac stunning and there can be uh, cardiac stunning either because of reperfusion injury or there can be a uh, patient is going to metabolic acidosis or electrolyte imbalance, all that can think can lead to hypotension when the patient is on ECMO. Or it can be severe SARS reaction, patient is going into sepsis or something of that sort. <coughs> so what will be the management? Increase into the ECMO blood flow, that is the first thing you should do. Second, you go for inodilators. Think about vasopressors. You might have to give, if a patient is going to sepsis or vasopressia, you have to give vasopressors rather than using inodilators. If patient is in cardiac stone, you use inodilators. If patient is going to sepsis, you have to think about using of vasopressors and the volumes. So when you increase the flow, when there is a mean artery pressure is low or normal and the tissue performance is not adequate, so patient is selected are still high, that in that case you have to increase the flow. The <coughs> pulse pressure are usually maintained well, <coughs> more than 15 years. The pre pump pressure is negative and you have adequate hemoglobin, then you have to go up on the ECMO flow. So that will probably sort out your issues. When you use inodilators, when you see there is a cardiac stunning is occurring, so there is no pulsatility or the pulse pressure is less than 10. In that case, you have to use inodilators like either in terms of dobutamine, milinone or adrenaline. 
when you use vasopressors, when there's a mean artery pressure is low, even with a good ECMO flow, even your ECMO flow is say 5 liters or 6 liters per minute, and in spite of that, your pressures are still a bit more, it means patient is in a vasoplegia or per peripheral vasodilator, and in that, you, what you require to use either no retinal node, vasopressin. And when the pre pump pressure is negative, hemoglobin is low, probably might require to uh, infuse the blood or colloids. So, what will be management of vasoplegia? One is vasopressors, or you can have a, like, uh, some people have tried like, in a salvage therapy, methylene blue, hydroxocarbamide, or ascorbic acid in a high dose. These are the things which have been tried for vasoplegia. You just because of time, I'll just go quickly through this. Methylene blue, you can think as a bolus dose, or can give you a, for a, uh, 24 hours, you can give an infusion. You can give B12, B12 as a bolus dose, okay? or you can give ascorbic acid again as a bolus dose for 6 hourly for first 3 to 4 days for a vasoplegia. Thank you. I'll be happy to answer your questions.